Hey everybody, this is Aaron Califato. I'm going to break format this week and introduce another guest storyteller. Let me give you all the accolades, tell, tell you all about her, and then I'll give you a quick backstory before we jump into her talk. Her name is Nina Doming. She's an actor, director, playwright, educator. She's a dear friend. I've known her for years. Um, and whether it's solo shows or arts education or traditional acting, she, there's not a lot that she hasn't done for decades and, and doing it from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, but specifically, she's the Nord Family Foundation Playwriting Fellow at the Cleveland Public Theater for the 2019-2020 season. And she's also one of two local artists in residence under the Barbara Smith Residency for Writers of Color at 12 Literary Arts Incubator this summer. Years ago, when I boomeranged back to Cleveland from New York, many of us boomeranged back. It's in our blood. It's part of us. Cities like this call us home. Some people boomerang back with championships like LeBron. And some people boomerang back with student debt and a dream like me. But that's what makes this more important because Nina was so gracious to me when I came back. And she mentored me. She listened to me. She cast me in plays. She was one of very few people uh, here in the city that supported me from an artistic standpoint. And I've always been grateful to her for that. I don't think I would have the artistic footing or foundation that I would have needed without her. And because of that, I've been able to develop a career as a storyteller here. And so when I got to sit down with her for 30 minutes, I was really jazzed because we talked and I was able to pull two seven minute segments from that talk, one that you'll hear today and one that we're going to release later in the year. But ironically, even though she has become really a, a an arts community leader in this area, she is originally from New Orleans. She's going to pronounce it better than I do. But that's where her story artistically started. And I'll let her take it from here. It was really in college that I started to understand how unique New Orleans was, you know, because when you're growing up there, it's, it's just home. It's where you're from. It's where you live. Mm -hmm. And when I started meeting, you know, different people from around the country when we would go to conferences and everything, because my world was New Orleans, Baton Rouge was where my grandmother lived, mm -hmm. um, my dad's mom. Uh, and maybe Biloxi, Mississippi, because sometimes we would go there, like go to the beach. And then Cleveland was a kind of distant memory because my mother's family is from here. And, um, and she died when I was very young. And we stayed in Louisiana pretty much. So that was my whole existence. And then in college, we would start, we would go to these festivals and, you know, not very far, but like Virginia, D.C. Mm. And I was like, wow, like, y'all don't eat what we eat. <laughs> y'all got different music I mean you know and it wasn't until then that I started to understand really how different New Orleans was and for me I was always just black and because I'm fair-skinned people would be like oh you Creole you Creole I was like no I'm black you know that was a very uh strategic thing that my father did um because he was very aware of the way um, light skin privilege and proximity to whiteness could work and could affect the way you grew up mm -hmm. um, because he he has seven siblings and within the seven of them, um, well, there are seven of them. He has six siblings. They range in skin complexion from looking very white <laughs> to, you know, a nice middle brown and then as is the way with black folk, everybody kind of married the opposite of the complexion that they were. Mm. <laughs> so we look like the Rainbow Coalition, you know. <laughs> but because he was so, because he looked white. It's like people would look at him and they go, well, your dad's white, but he's not like white, white. Like, what is he? Is he, is he Spanish? Is he French? Is he Creole? What is he? And, um, you know, he didn't have any control over that. And, uh, you know, growing up, looking that way in Louisiana during the civil rights movement, um, you know, he never intentionally wanted to pass. And at every opportunity, he'd be like, no, I'm black. And that's actually because of my grandparents. Can you go further with what to pass means? Absolutely. So 
well, and I'll start here. So my grandparents, um, who met when they were teenagers, um, it, in the 30s, the Louisiana census, uh, you know, they're going around, and they're like, how many people in your house? You know, asking the questions. And they asked, you know, what is your, your race? And they said, well, Creole. And they said, well, there is no such thing. You're either black or you're white. And they said, oh, we black then, period. That's what it is. And so they, they had a lot of pride in um you know being black and and what that means and so but there are five branches of the domain family now we don't all know each other but we know if you have that name you related to to us because your family (laughs) yeah nobody has Mm -hmm. that that name so there are you know the black creole domains in louisiana there are the white domains in new york um, which I found out accidentally. That's a funny story. Um, and then there are, you know, some domains spread around the country. But in California, there are specifically the black domains who left Louisiana to pass for white. And passing means it's like in appearance, like if you look at them, they might look a little ethnically ambiguous, but they look more white than they do anything else. Um, so if you think about like, uh, so easy, so difficult and challenging to describe. But it was a choice that many people of color made at certain times because you could advance. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, if, if people thought you were white, if they didn't know you were black uh-huh. and you didn't correct them, then that was a thing you could do. Yeah. And that was absolutely a thing that my father was not going to allow. Not that I could. You know, I'm very, you know, ethnic presenting. And, you know, my mother... Um, her family is black and, you know, darker complexioned and all of that. So, but um, even though I'm fair skinned, you know, I have what are considered, you know, African features. I have a broad nose and thick lips and kinky hair and all of that. But um, how did I get there? <laughs> we were talking about New Orleans. We were talking New Orleans. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I didn't realize how Creole I was until I left the city. Um, you know, because I, you know, I'm black all day and anybody that knows me will tell you, oh, nigga black, you know, if anybody asks, but I, there were some cultural things that I didn't realize were so ingrained and it's like, no, actually I am really like Creole too. I'm black Creole. Like my, this is a very like base example, but soul food for me is not fried chicken and macaroni cheese and green soul food for me is gumbo and etouffee and catfish (laughs) and red Mm -hmm. beans and rice you know um because yeah i grew up in in the lower ninth ward so um you know it wasn't until i left that Mm -hmm. i gained a, a better appreciation for that and an understanding of that and particularly when i went to grad school um and i went to grad school at west virginia university and our thesis, I have a Master of Fine Arts in Acting, our thesis, the way that our professors described it, they said your thesis needs to be your definitive, definitive work as an artist to date. And it should include like all of these things, whatever the uh-huh. list was. And I was like, well, that's great. None of the roles that are available to me in this season do that. And they were like, well, sure, this, this, this. I was like, mm-mm, because... While you all might believe in the notion of colorblind casting, I do not. I believe in non-traditional casting, Mm. but you can't unsee me, you know. And you see me, you see a certain thing, and you bring your experience or understanding of what that is to the experience of what I'm presenting as a storyteller. I said, well, y'all aren't doing anything about any black women, and you certainly aren't doing anything about any Afro-Creole women. So I'm going to write a solo show. (laughs) So that's when it started. That's I when, didn't, you know, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's when it started. I hope you enjoyed the episode. A lot of people have been coming up to Aaron and I at parties, sending emails and calling to tell us how much they love the podcast and ask when the next episode's coming out. A great way to stay connected is to visit the website, 7 com. You can also subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And while you're there... Let more people know what you think about Aaron and his storytelling by rating and leaving a review. Lastly, the biggest compliment you can give us is to share your favorite episode with friends on social media. Thanks again for listening.